I want to welcome you uh, to this uh, ITIF event on uh, healthcare innovation in a time of austerity that we're really honored to co-host with our colleague Alberto Mingardi, who's the general director of the Bruno Leone Institute in Italy and one of the leading thinkers in uh, on healthcare policy in uh, in Europe. So it's a, I think a really great opportunity as we both face similar kinds of challenges to have a joint discussion about how we, as two major regions, address those. So, uh, so I'm Rob Atkinson. I'm president of ITIF. What I want to do is just quickly introduce our panel. I'll make some very brief introductory remarks. Alberto will make some very brief introductory remarks, and then we'll hear from our speakers. Uh, we'll adjourn precisely at 12, and we should have plenty of time for questions uh, and comments from you all. So I'll just go in the order uh, on the table here. Uh, Carlo Cartarelli is uh, the director of fiscal affairs at the department uh, uh, at, at fiscal affairs department at the IMF, and um, you really haven't been doing much for the last few months. You've been basically on vacation, I think, and uh, sort of the same U.S. The kind of like the Maytag repairman. Uh, uh, so uh, really pleased that he can join us today, given all of the turmoil that I'm sure you're dealing with. Uh, he's received uh, degrees in economics from the University of Siena and the London School of Economics. He joined the research department of the Bank of Italy uh, from 1981 to 1987, and has been at the IMF since 1988 uh, in a wide variety of roles. He's also written several papers on fiscal and monetary policy and edited books on inflation, monetary policy, and exchange rates. Uh, Nick Everstadt is a political economist and demographer uh, with the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, he's also a senior advisor to the National Board of Asian Research and a member of the Visiting Committee of the Harvard School of Public Health and a member of the Global Leadership Council of the World Economic Forum. Uh, he's also uh, author of several monographs, uh, numerous monographs and articles, including a book on the poverty of the poverty rate at ADI Press 2008. Uh, next is uh, Abraham Klink, who is a professor of healthcare and labor market at the Free University of Amsterdam. Uh, prior to this position, uh, Dr. Klink served as the National Minister of Healthcare for the Netherlands. Uh, his other government positions included being a member of the Netherlands Senate and the chair of the Committee on Education. I should add, by the way, while he was the Minister of Healthcare, he uh, helped lead uh, a major reform in healthcare uh, in, um, in the Netherlands, which we'll hear about today. He's also the CEO of the Scientific Institute of the Christian Democratic Party and the head of policy uh, at the Ministry of Justice and Deputy, where he's been CEO since 1996. He has a PhD uh, from the Ricks University, University of Leiden, I think yeah. is really what it is. More or less is so. Uh, Alberto, our co-host, as I said, is the general director of the Bruno Leone Institute. Uh, he's worked at various think tanks in Europe, including the Center for New Europe in Brussels, where he was a senior fellow. Uh, he's also published in a wide variety of uh, sort uh, areas, including the Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, International Herald Tribune, and he has a recent uh, uh, a recent book that he edited called. Uh, I'll give you the Italian title. I think you'll all know what it means. FRC Move. That's a wonderful way of <laughs> My Italian is as good as my French. Uh, it, and yet it moves how healthcare is evolving in Europe between the private and public. Uh, Mike Mandel. Uh, Mike uh, is the chief economist, chief ec ec economic strategist at the that's Progressive that's Policy right. Institute. Uh, he's written several recent papers on healthcare innovation, including how the FDA impedes innovation, a case study in over regulation. I just need to say that uh, the, the subject of that paper, Melafine, was approved this morning by the FDA. So oh. that, that they had, I wrote that paper because they had been, uh, they had been given a non-approval letter and the FDA reversed it, so. That must be because of the paper. Actually, part of it, it partly was. Yes. Okay. We can talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Uh, many of you may know Mike from his days as the chief economist at Business Week, where he, he wrote many of the really, really interesting articles or major stories when he was at Business Week. Uh, through that, he was named one of the top 100 business journalists for the 20th century, uh, also best economic journalist of the year, and has his PhD uh, in economics from Harvard. And last is uh, my colleague Val Giddings. Val is a uh, Senior Fellow at ITIF uh, dealing with life sciences. 
where he focuses on science and regulatory policy regarding uh, relating to biotechnology and life sciences innovation. Uh, he has a long background. Uh, he used to be, a long time ago, he was at the Congressional Office of Technology Assessment, uh, if you all remember that, where he dealt with uh, studies in biotechnology. Uh, he was also, is also Vice President and CEO of Prometheus AB, which provides consulting services on life sciences issues. Um, so with that, let me just start by, by framing this discussion very quickly. Um, why are, we, why are we talking about innovation? Uh, and I think one way to think about it is we could certainly cut costs uh, if we wanted to by simply not investing any more in innovation in uh, healthcare. Uh, we could imagine that my daughter or my son, when they get to be my age, 40 or 50 years from now, uh, that they basically have the same drugs and the same devices we have today. Uh, that would save an enormous amount of money. We wouldn't have to spend any more money developing drugs. We wouldn't have to spend any more money on R&D and new devices. Uh, but we wouldn't have any new drugs or devices. And essentially, I guess that that's really the core question. Does anybody want to live in that world where we freeze medical innovation? And so the question really is, how do we make sure that we keep going with innovation at the same time dealing with austerity and budget challenges? The other, I think, key component of this for America and Europe is that we both lead the world in life sciences innovation. It's actually the, the industry, I think, that we are perhaps strongest in. Uh, for the U.S., uh, our life sciences, our share, global share of life sciences output is up 6% uh, from 1995 to 2007. So the U.S. has actually gained share in life sciences. Uh, Europe is stable. Uh, so for both of these, uh, both of our regions, it's an important industry. It's also an important source of high-wage jobs. Um, but the real question then is, how do we maintain that? How do we continue to get innovation in new drugs and devices, uh, and at the same time cut costs? And I think one of the themes you'll hear today, uh, particularly from Mike but others, is we need to focus relentlessly on driving healthcare productivity, not necessarily cost reduction, which. Uh, Mike and others may explain, but productivity, in other words, being able to get more with less. Uh, and clearly innovation can play a role in that. Imagine if we could develop a cure tomorrow for Alzheimer's. That would be a huge productivity increase. In other words, we would have much more health, which is really the outcome you want, with much less input costs. Same thing with diabetes. Uh, another area to look at is, uh, for example, in diagnostics. Um, IBM, as you may have seen on the Jeopardy a while back, uh, the IBM Watson computer, really not a computer, it's sort of a computer, it's also a software program, uh, it beat uh, all of the champions, including uh, Ken Jennings, I guess. Uh, but one of the things that, that I heard recently, I was on a panel with the chief scientist at IBM, had research, um, and so they actually, one of the things they did with Watson is they programmed it with a lot of medical information uh, while they were doing these tests and they were seeing how, how good it was. And there was a case there where there was a uh, disease, uh, one of the doctors who was programming, there was a disease that he had been involved with, a, a woman uh, about a decade ago who had, had some very you know, troubling disease, and they couldn't figure out what it was. They had specialists, they did test after test after test, a lot of money, a lot of specialists. It took them all, over a year and a quarter to figure out uh, what the right diagnosis was. Uh, they put this information into Watson, and within two seconds, Watson came up with the right diagnosis. Now, I'm not saying that that's going to be able to do every diagnosis. I really have no idea. But imagine, though, if we could get uh, a 50% increase in diagnostic efficiency in this country or in the world, the kinds of cost savings that, that we could get. So I think, at least certainly from the ITIF view, we need to think about healthcare from cutting healthcare consumption, but boosting healthcare investment. In other words, we need to be making more investments in the kinds of uh, innovations that are going to improve outcomes and cut costs, but at the same time, reducing consumption that we don't need to have. So one of the big challenges we have, unfortunately, is that we really don't score that. OMB, CBO doesn't score healthcare productivity. As Mike will talk about, uh, FDA doesn't really think about healthcare productivity in, in the way they might. So I think we all have significant challenges there. So I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Alberto, and you can either do it from there. Or from here. Thank you. Um, thank you, Rob. I will try to be as brief, even though not equally insightful as you think. 
I'm very grateful to all of you for having uh, decided to spend this morning with us. It's been a great pleasure to organize. Can you turn your mic on? Yeah, you guys have got to have the green light. Okay. There you go. Oh, there you go. Right. It was counterintuitive to me. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> It's been a great pleasure to co-organize this conference together with ITAF, and I really want to thank Rob Atkins, Kat, Alexis, all their staff uh, for their marvelous work. The European debt crisis, I mean, just to add a little bit of why, uh, a little bit of perspective on why a European think tank is partnering on, on this event. The European debt crisis is progressing at full speed, and it's leading us in uncharted waters. It is only natural then to focus in such circumstances on the day-by-day -day progression of events, alternating hope, well, I suppose some days, uh, and despair. And also for, the re for this reason, we are very, very grateful for, to, to Carlo Cottarelli for spending some hours with us today, in spite of the fact that it's clearly very, very busy. However, uh, even in face of the event, it will be myopic to forget that the dramatic predicament in which we are navigating today is by and large the consequence of years of public policy. To put it bluntly, European states have grown too large and too heavy. And in this uh, framework, not just today, but because of the democratic trends that I think Nick Eberstadt will focus upon, the old premises that shape the social pact between voters and rulers in Europe cannot any longer be honored. The so-called European social model looks, up to a point, irreconcilable with, well, reality. The 20th century, we all know, is so uh, an inordinate expansion of public spending. In 1870, right after its unification, Italy's public spending accounted for something like 13% of its GDP. As Vito Tanzi and Ludger Schuchnet reminded us in the same in our book, public spending started to grow in the 20s when some welfare provisions were needed to be put in place to cope with the devastation of the First World War. However, public spending grew slowly until the 60s. Between the late 60s and the late 80s, its pace grew fast and faster, reaching the level of 50% of GDP or even more in countries like Italy, Austria, Belgium, France, the Netherlands. Such a gargantuan increase in the scope of government action was at least in part financed through indebtedness, and of course, I mean, we're seeing the consequence of that right these days. Well, of all items uh, that make for this ever-increasing public expenditure, healthcare is clearly among the least controversial. And, of course, I mean, when you look at the uh, politics of the game, <coughs> cutting healthcare budgets is an especially unpopular measure, particularly because European states have all a rapidly aging population. A universal access healthcare system is among the most popular features of the European welfare state. And that's clear when you listen to citizens and poll them, in spite of the fact they may lament from time to time the its, its inefficiencies as they encounter them as patients. So the aging of European population suggests the demand of healthcare services will continue to increase in the next few years and the fact that patients are becoming better informed and more active themselves, thanks among other things to the internet and technology, suggests that it may even become a more demanding demand. At the same time, the permanent fiscal crisis in which some European states, certainly my own, are going to struggle for the foreseeable future, suggests that supply of healthcare services needs to be rationalized somehow. At the very same time, the pace of technological innovation creates further pressure on the system. Though technological innovation is by no means necessarily bound to increase cost, new equipment and innovating treatments are expensive in the short run. At the same time, the bureaucratization of healthcare system is the equivalent of a steady accumulation of cholesterol which is making innovation in providing services unduly difficult and creates waste that affects public finances. So how shall we find a way out of this muddle? 
Well, though no conference has ever saved the world, actually, uh, I think today we will really struggle to find some answers. This conference is very important and precious, I think, both for IBL and ITIF because it brings together very different perspectives on a very controversial and interesting subject. We know that some remedies we tried in the past uh, have shown to have unintended consequences. We're now quite knowledgeable about. I'm thinking, for example, of price controls. But at the very same time, we have example of governments that are trying somehow to experiment uh, with healthcare reform to make the system a little bit more sustainable. Um, that's the case of the Netherlands. We are fortunate enough to have Dr. Klink with us. The healthcare reform he superintended over there is meant to channel healthcare financing to competing insurance companies, to separating, separating I'm sorry, healthcare and politics to a greater deal than it was before. The German government has taken a very different route, basically outsourcing a great deal of hospital care. Even in Italy, you got some experimentation going on. My own region of Lombardy, for example, established a quasi-competitive uh, system among different healthcare providers that work well up to a point, even though it's as any healthcare system in the world, uh, showing to have its good deal of, of problems. I think these issues are so important and so difficult, quite frankly, that they deserve a throughout debate. And of course, the big challenge we have is that you know innovation, sustainability, and access basically look like the riddle of the cabbage, the goat, and the wolf. And uh, somehow today we are trying to understand which one needs to go first to the other side of the river. So uh, I'm sure we will have a great debate. And thank you very much again for being here. Great, thank you, Carl. Uh, Val, you want to kick us off? <coughs> sure. Um, you need to use a mic, by the way. You might want to, you might want to come on up oh, here. Okay. Since you're doing a <laughs> Rob asked me to make some uh, brief remarks this morning to try to set the stage uh, for what will follow. Um, and based on our dinner conversations last night, I have no doubt they'll be very interesting, so I'll try to be brief. But, um, you know, we face a number of challenges, and trying to figure out uh, where you want to go in facing those challenges. Uh, is unnecessarily difficult if you don't have a clear sense of where you are and how you got where you are. So, um, <clears throat> being of a historical bent, I'd like to take a, a couple of minutes and uh, and and expand on on those those particular points. Um, but uh, it, it's it's particularly topical at the moment to talk about where we are. Uh, Today is November second. On uh, October thirty first, a couple of days ago, uh, with a really remarkable instinct, not for the jugular, but for the capillaries, uh, President Obama signed an executive order, quote, to reduce prescription drugs shortages and fight price gouging uh, to deal with this issue of, of, of uh, how to handle the healthcare problems that we face. Uh, and it's, it's worth looking at this uh, and considering what the elements are in this executive order that the President signed. Uh, the first thing that it does is directs the FDA to broaden the reporting of potential shortages of certain prescription drugs. Okay, this is basic, uh, but not particularly uh, uh, helpful, I think, in solving the problems. Uh, it further directs uh, FDA to uh, expedite regulatory reviews that can help prevent or respond to shortages. And the components of this are to expedite the review of new manufacturing sites and drug suppliers and manufacturing changes to help prevent shortages. Okay, again, it's pretty basic. Um, and uh, furthermore, uh, the president is asking other firms, directing FDA to ask other firms to increase their production uh, and working with manufacturers to identify ways to mitigate quality issues, i.e. flexibility through regulatory discretion uh, and expediting the review of regulatory submissions. Now, all, all this is well and good, but, uh, and, and regulatory reform, which this sort of nibbles around the edges of, is certainly necessary, uh, but, but this barely begins to tackle the problem. We've got a giant Gordian knot here, and this is at best a pocket knife. It's certainly not a sword uh, that's up to the task. Um, <clears throat> this is, it's definitely not the way to win the 21st century. 
Um, there are, let me share a couple of other salient facts about where we are here in, at this point in 2011. Uh, in 2011, we expect that 5,000 individual human genomes will be sequenced this year, uh, and that number is expected next year to be in the realm of 30,000. That's 30,000 individual humans who will have their entire DNA sequence decoded uh, and accessible for, for analysis uh, and, and use in a variety of ways. Um, <clears throat> Wisconsin, uh, University of Wisconsin Medical Center is right now today offering uh, full genome sequences to children with undiagnosed diseases as a means of beginning to get a handle on what's going on in these cases. Uh, also in 2011, uh, not directly in the biomedical sphere, but nonetheless of fundamental importance, uh, in agriculture, biotech crops are being grown today on 366 million acres in 29 countries by 15.4 million farmers, of whom 14.4 million are smallholders in developing countries. 75% of the global population is found in countries that are growing or importing biotech crops. <coughs> so just hold on to that idea. So that, that's, that's a quick snapshot of where we are today. Uh, how did we get here? Uh, as I mentioned, I have a bit of a historical bent, so bear with me. Uh, but humanity's first attempts to come to grips with uh, the challenges of biology and to start to manage and manipulate those to our benefit uh, can really be traced to the dawn of agriculture, which is nine to 11,000 years before the present. Uh, there were a whole host of really brilliant <coughs> innovations that took place in this process, uh, ranging from the domestication of wheat in Sumeria and Anatolia, the domestication of corn or maize in Central America, the domestication of livestock in Central Asia, uh, and progress was made in all these areas fairly steadily, but at a relatively slow rate, uh, for several, uh, for, for about, uh, about 10 millennia. Um, the under, human understanding of biology first began to be really systematized in a, in a, in a useful way uh, only in the past thousand years. And the first real significant breakthrough, I think, uh, took place in Germany about 250 years ago, uh, where uh, scientists began to do some experiments in plant breeding. Uh, and <clears throat> some of the things that they found were quite unexpected and, right, and really remarkable. And I have one quote here I'd like to share with you uh, from one of the early plant breeders, uh, Johannes Siegebeck, <coughs> excuse me, who said, what man will ever believe that God Almighty should have introduced such confusion or rather such shameful whoredom for the propagation of the reign of plants? Who will instruct young students in such a voluptuous system without scandal? <clears throat> you know, we, we, uh, we were just beginning to come to groups of understanding how sexuality works in plants, uh, which of course is the basis uh, for dissent with change, which Darwin first made clear to us in 1859 with The Origin of Species. <clears throat> Gregor Mendel, who, who uh, uh, published his work in 1863 on uh, uh, what's called particulate inheritance, first demonstrated the fact that that uh, the traits we observe are conveyed by, uh, by particles which are inherited, passed on from one generation to another. This work was so pathbreaking that at the time, none of his contemporaries had any idea what on earth to do with it. And so his work languished uh, undiscovered and unexamined for almost 40 years until it was rediscovered in 1900. <coughs> and you know, that led, <coughs> combined with Darwin's insights, to the explosion of understanding and the increase of knowledge that we've seen in the, in the uh, 20th century. Uh, there were a whole host of really interesting things that, uh, that took place at regular intervals. Uh, and uh, I'd love to go through all of them, but of course, the single most important event, uh, arguably, of the 20th century uh, took place in 1953 when Jim Watson and Francis Crick, uh, using data that they had nicked from a colleague, Rosalind Franklin, uh, figured out the structure of DNA, uh, which a whole host of, of experiments in series had identified as the hereditary material, uh, which was really quite surprising uh, because of some of its unique characteristics uh, and, and behavior. Um, so uh, <coughs> Watson and Crick figured, figured out the structure of DNA in 1953, uh, but it wasn't really until about 1958 that we knew how many chromosomes Homo sapiens had. Indeed, it was in 1959 that the first chromos human chromosomal defect was actually identified, which is Down syndrome, trisomy 21. 
uh, which is a, a syndrome that's possessed by individuals who have three copies of, of one of the very smallest chromosomes. Um, <coughs> again, the research continued uh, in a whole variety of ways uh, on, a, on a vast number of, of very interesting questions and challenges of no obvious uh, um, practical significance or import. Uh, but in 1968, Werner Arbor isolated restriction enzymes, which were the enzymes that certain bacteria, uh, uh, certain um, <coughs> bacteria used to prevent viral infections, uh, and that's laid the groundwork for recombinant DNA techniques. Um, <coughs> in 1985, Kerry Mullis developed PCR, the ability to uh, uh, analyze DNA uh, from very small samples and figure out exactly what you're dealing with uh, in a variety of contexts. Uh, but the first discussions, serious discussions of, of possibly sequencing the human genome took place in 1986, which led in less than a decade to the publication of the, uh, the, the working draft of the human genome at a cost of a billion dollars. <coughs> we have today uh, no less than uh, 27 companies uh, offering a variety of uh, genome sequencing and personal genetics approaches to analyze your genome to detect your proclivities for a variety of hereditary diseases. Uh, so where is all this going? Well, without continued innovation, we're going nowhere fast. The hope is that tailored genomic medicine will offer significant improvements in diagnosis and treatment, <clears throat> but by 2050, we expect to have 10 billion people on the planet <clears throat> who will need to be fed, clothed, and their diseases and illnesses treated. Uh, this means, there, means there's a desperate and urgent need for innovation in every area of the life sciences. Uh, and um, <clears throat> it's great that you are all here this morning to help us start this dialogue. Uh, and I look forward to uh, hearing what you have to say and continuing this not only today, but uh, in future weeks, months, and years. Great. Thanks very much. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Nick. Yes. <clears throat> Uh, you good? I think Line? maybe I'll go up there yeah. so I can see my own PowerPoint. It's a, uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you all this morning. And um, my message is uh, very simple. If you think that health care budgets are under pressure today, you ain't seen nothing yet. I'm going to show you some of the demographic trends that are going to be unfolding, not just in the United States, but in Europe and other OECD areas. And I think that these numbers will convince you that we are just entering a time in which social and demographic change are going to be placing increasing and I suspect unbearable change uh, pressures on the pay-as-you-go uh, arrangements by which we finance uh, most of our medical and health care services in the United States and other OECD countries. Uh, let's start by looking at uh, the supply of workers for the future. Uh, this is the this number of births each year in Germany between 1960 and 2010. You'll see that the, uh, the number of births has dropped by over half. These are going to be the prospective workers in the new Germany uh, 20 years from now. But the number of uh, new workers coming into Germany in this future is going to be a lot fewer than the number of new retirees on current uh, retirement arrangements for, for Germany. Um, show you an even more interesting uh, graphic, uh, which is for Japan. Uh, Japan has uh, about one-third as many births nowadays as it had 60 years ago. And on a pay-as-you-go set of arrangements for health care, uh, pensions, and the like, 
uh, you see where this arithmetic is uh, leading. I mean, I don't know that we'll necessarily get back to Amaterasu by the end of that graphic, but there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of inversion that's coming into the pay-as-you-go system. Um, if you look at Europe as a whole, or if you look at the Eurozone as a whole, you can see the pressure that is inexorably building upon current arrangements for healthcare financing. Uh, you don't need to be an actuary or an economist to see where this is going, right? Um, so what does this mean for the, uh, for the next generation? Uh, we, can, we can probably project fairly accurately out about 30 years in Western societies because even 30 years out we're not getting into the business of uh, guessing how many babies the unborn are going to be having. Um, so this is what you're talking about in a today's Germany versus a future Germany. You see how the working age groups are shrinking. Uh, and you see how the older population groups are growing. You see what this is going to mean for a healthcare system which, whose incidence of consumption rises very steeply in an age-specific manner. Uh, that's Germany. That's Western Europe as a whole. That's Japan. Bye-bye. And. Uh, and this is the United States, which is slightly different, but not so very different that we can't say that the same pressures are accumulating and gathering in our society. Now, how do you, you know, how does one deal with these? Um, we have to recognize that on uh, on current definitions, if we define the working age groups as 15 to 64, as demographers. Um, arbitrarily, but not entirely unrealistically, unre tend to do, um, labor forces in much of the affluent world are going to be shrinking in the years ahead, even with immigration. All of these projections assume immigration uh, over the years ahead, uh, except for not too much for Japan, but uh, for reasons we all understand. Um, immigration has the possibility, the possibility of changing the arithmetic of retirees to working age populations on current arrangements to some degree, to some degree, but it doesn't change the general trend. Um, here's another problem that we all have in, uh, in dealing with the rising pressure on healthcare and pension budgets. We've enjoyed an absolutely glorious explosion, a blessing of health improvement in all of the Western societies over the last half uh, century. The problem in uh, the problem in financing social welfare systems is that all of that improvement in life expectancy and health has been translated into retirement and vacation, and then some. So you can't keep on going in those two disparate directions. France is a slightly extreme case, but it's uh, this is a generally true in all of the OECD countries. You can't keep this going and finance the existing arrangements that we uh, that we live under. Um, and in some parts of in some parts of the OECD world, uh, there has been an absolute route, uh, not just a retreat, not just a flight, but an absolute route from the working, from the labor market for people over the age of 55. Uh, in the United States, in Europe, in Japan, people in their 50s and 60s are healthier, more educated, more potentially productive than any of their counterparts in history ever before, and they work less than any of their counterparts ever before. Um, that I think is unsustainable. Um, 
as a consequence of the existing arrangements and some of these demographic uh, pressures that I mentioned, a, a new relationship has emerged between public debt and population aging. A generation ago, there was absolutely no correspondence in OECD countries between the uh, ratio of public debt to GDP and the percentage of people in that country over the age of 65. Now there is a highly imprecise but detectable arrangement. Aging doesn't account for all of public debt, obviously. There are a lot of other things that go on. But generally speaking, for every extra percentage point of population over the age of 65, uh, one sees about seven extra percentage points of debt to GDP in OECD countries today. And over the next, um, over the next 20 years, the percentage of people over the age of 65 in OECD countries is projected to rise by six uh, percentage points. So do the math uh, on current arrangements. Um, to make matters even more fun, the average age of voters all around the world is inexorably increasing. For some reason, I chose to put Greece on the board today. But, uh, but the point is a more general one. Um, on the current trajectory, uh, the average age of a prospective voter in Greece today is a little bit below 50. 30 years from now, the average age of a prospective voter in Greece is on track to be about 56 or 57. Um, when you consider what the pensionable age is in Greece, you see that we get into some really interesting political economy issues if we stay on the current uh, course. Who is going to be voting to expropriate themselves from existing pension and health guarantees? So, so here we are. Uh, what does all of this have to do with healthcare innovation? It makes it more urgent than ever before uh, because knowledge production in all different aspects of endeavor change the boundaries of the possible. <coughs> knowledge production increases productivity, it increases efficiency, in that sense it lowers, uh, it increases bang per buck and lowers costs if you want to put it that way uh, in all sorts of different areas of endeavor and if we are going to if we are going to deal with the looming challenges that demographics places upon our Western societies we're going to have to change our existing arrangements for financing healthcare services in the future that may not be a lot of fun but technical innovation is going to make it that much easier. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, oh. okay. uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very happy to be here today to talk about this uh, very important topic, something that I personally regard as the most important topic for public finances over the next uh, decades. Uh, um, and uh, if uh, Nicholas uh, gave you uh, bad uh, news, I think I'm going <laughs> to add more bad news about this. Uh, because in a nutshell, uh, although demographic is a very important driver of healthcare spending, the past uh, uh, is uh, teaching, is telling us that is not uh, the main driver. And there are further pressures that are coming from, from, other, from other sources. Uh, at uh, the IMF, uh, we look at uh, healthcare issues from the standpoint of uh, macroeconomic stability, which is our mandate. And particularly in my department, we look at the issue of uh, fiscal fiscal stability. And this is what I will uh, I will talk today. Healthcare reform is uh, is very important for fiscal stability in in, in most uh, I would say all advanced uh, uh, countries. Uh, advanced countries uh, uh, are facing a huge task uh, in terms of ensuring the stability of their uh, fiscal accounts. 
as a result of the increase uh, in, in the public debt, which is the ratio of debt is accompanied uh, the, the global crisis that started in 2008. We're talking about an increase in the debt to GDP ratio of about uh, 35 percentage points of GDP for the average of the advanced uh, country. Stabilizing uh, uh, pension and healthcare spending as much as possible over the next decades will be a key component of any strategy of fiscal adjustment. I'm talking about stabilizing because it's going to be very difficult uh, to uh, lower the spending to GDP ratio in this area, which means that the fiscal adjustment that is needed to first stabilize and that lower the debt to GDP ratio will have to come from other sources. But it is at least important to stabilize, at least to try to stabilize the spending for healthcare and pension over the next uh, decades. Uh, more specifically, I will let me see. Uh, 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 yeah, I don't see the escape. Escape. Okay, escape is. No, 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 no. no, 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 no. <laughs> escape. Okay. Is not the right one. Ah, this one. Okay, I'm going to talk about three topics. Uh, uh, first, I will examine the trends in public health spending over the next, uh, over the past uh, uh, 40 years in advanced economy. Second, I will uh, provide uh, uh, country-specific projections on healthcare spending uh, for uh, uh, advanced economies. And third, uh, I will uh, try to identify reforms options that could help uh, in this respect to contain increase in, in, in spending for health uh, care. So let's start from uh, the past. Uh, past spending trends uh, indicate large increase in health care spending over the last uh, uh, 40 years. Uh, on average, uh, the increase from, was from about 6% uh, of uh, GDP to, at the beginning of the period to about 12% of GDP. Uh, at the end of the period. This increase was uh, mostly, or at least to a large extent, uh, driven by public spending, which increased from 3 to about 7% uh, of GDP. Uh, this uh, trend increase was characterized by not uh, constant uh, year after year. There were periods in which the increases were faster than in other periods. Uh, and uh, the, the early acceleration between 1970 1980 was primarily due to the extension of benefits in advanced countries, which by 1980 were in most countries almost universal. Uh, expansion again accelerated in uh, in the 1990s before another period of containment in the second half of the 1990s. And since 2000, the further increase that you see in healthcare spending has been uh, um, reflecting a more widespread phenomena or increase in public spending to GDP ratio uh, in, uh, before, before the crisis. Uh, behind uh, the large increase uh, in, uh, uh, in, in average uh, health spending, there are large differences across uh, countries. Uh, for example, between 1980 and 2008, seven countries experienced increases larger uh, be, sorry, uh, seven countries experienced increases in their public spending for health care of more than two and a half percentage points of GDP. Uh, these are United States, Portugal, Korea, New Zealand, Greece, United Kingdom, and Iceland. While three countries uh, experience uh, very small increases, Sweden, Ireland, uh, and Denmark. In this chart, you don't find my own country, Italy, for because of some funny reason, I don't know why it's not there, but Italy is about at the level of Germany, so it's a fairly low increase, uh, as I will mention uh, later on. Uh, about, uh, and this is particularly important, non-democratic factors are the main driver of healthcare spending. This is the title of this, uh, of this uh, slide. Um, population aging about one four, explains one-fourth of the increase in the spending to GDP ratio over the last uh, uh, 40 years. The remainder is what we call excess uh, cost uh, growth, and this captures the effect of several factors. Uh, on the demand side, healthcare spending tends to rise as a share of GDP as countries uh, develop. It is a superior growth, as sometimes we say. On the supply side, 
this is very important, technological advances, unlike other sectors, in the healthcare sector have actually increased their cost, essentially because you get new products, better products, uh, uh, but also more expensive products. This is what has happened over the last uh, 40, 40 years. Uh, third, uh, uh, the Boba effect, uh, uh, this is a term that economists use to indicate the fact that uh, uh, wages uh, in a certain sector with lower productivity growth increase as much as wages in sectors with high productivity growth. And as a result of this, the unit level cost in those sectors, including the healthcare sector, uh, tends uh, to rise quite uh, rapidly. And finally, and this is in a way good news, health policies and institutions do matter. As we saw, there were large differences in increased healthcare spending, so no countries are managing their healthcare system uh, in a way that is equally efficient. And the fact that there are large inefficiencies that has been actually, as it has also been shown by several studies by our colleagues at the OECD, uh, indicate that there is room for uh, savings uh, without uh, weakening uh, the quality of healthcare uh, systems. Uh, looking forward, uh, Okay. Uh, let's see. okay. Let's uh, let's look ahead over the next uh, uh, twenty years. Uh, spending is projected to increase by about uh, three percentage points of GDP in the average of uh, the advanced countries over the next uh, twenty years. The simple average is a bit lower, is about, and, and the median is also a bit lower, uh, something about uh, around two percent uh, of uh, GDP. About one third of this increase is uh, due to aging, to demographic factors. The rest is due to, uh, mostly, to uh, technological change. Of course, there is a lot of uncertainty here. We don't know to what extent the past uh, will describe the future, but in the past we saw that technological change was a key driver of uh, increasing healthcare uh, spending. The projected increase is particularly large for the United States, uh, where you see an increase there of the order of five percentage points of GDP over the next uh, 20 years. Uh, projected increases are smaller in Europe, but are still uh, sizable. Our projections show that the healthcare spending in Europe is projected to rise by about two percentage points of GDP on average. Uh, with the spending expected to rise by three percentage points or more in seven uh, European uh, countries, which I think uh, highlighted uh, here. This increase in Europe by about two percentage points is actually larger than uh, the baseline projections prepared by the European Commission in their 2009 uh, aging report. And essentially the difference between our projection uh, and, and the uh, uh, European uh, Union projections relates uh, to um, uh, the estimate how much uh, technological change uh, will impact on, 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 on spending. Uh, the EU has a relatively optimistic assumption that there will be no, essentially, no impact of, from technological change, uh, changes on healthcare spending. Now let's go to the next uh, key question. Uh, what can be done to slow down the increase, uh, this unsustainable increase in healthcare uh, spending? Our work uh, suggests uh, five tools uh, to contain uh, spending pressure. The first uh, is uh, budget caps that have been used uh, in, for example, in Italy, Japan, and Sweden. These are budgetary limits on overall healthcare spending, but also spending on subsectors or even individual providers. Examples include uh, global budget for hospital and expenditure ceiling for general practitioners. They have been uh, effective in containing spending in uh, many advanced countries, uh, as it is mentioned here, Italy, Japan, and Sweden are some of them. However, to be effective, they need to be uh, broad based uh, because otherwise, uh, the, the, the components that are not covered they tend to rise more rapidly than, uh, than others. Um, Budget caps, uh, however, needs to be supported by micro uh, reforms, uh, and I come to this to improve efficiency, otherwise you have an impact on the quality of uh, health care. Uh, second, uh, 
uh, this is a bit of a uh, all comprehensive uh, uh, item uh, that I think is characterized by the fact that these are measures that affect the decision making uh, process, which we group here under the heading of contracting and public uh, management. This includes uh, greater reliance uh, on uh, managed care. Gatekeeping uh, is a key uh, feature of managed care, uh, as well as greater reliance on, on uh, case-based uh, um, payment system, as in Germany and in Italy. All this can help improving, uh, improve the efficiency of, of spending. The case-based approach stands uh, in contrast to uh, systems of heavy reliance uh, on fee-for-service providers like in Switzerland and Korea, which provide greater uh, payments uh, for most costly uh, treatment. Case-based uh, system in contrast can provide appropriate incentives uh, to contain costs by using most effective uh, treatments, which in turn encourages the development of uh, more cost-effective uh, technologies. Uh, Sub-national governments, uh, it's also important how they interrelate and negotiate with central governments on health care financing and provision. And this, again, has uh, helped uh, lower uh, cost, uh, uh, health care costs in countries like uh, Canada and Sweden. Third, uh, a stronger role uh, for competition in choices in Germany and Japan. This involves allowing uh, patients uh, increased choice between uh, across providers and insurers and uh, increased competition uh, among providers and insurers. Fourth, uh, demand side uh, uh, reforms uh, can, uh, such as greater reliance uh, on uh, private financing, uh, co payments, uh, cost sharing. Uh, Australia, Canada, France uh, are a good example. Uh, they rely significantly on private insurance uh, for non-essential uh, services not covered by public uh, packages. However, a greater role of uh, the private sector needs to be private sector financing needs to be combined with adequate protection for those who cannot afford uh, uh, paying for their own uh, medical treatment. Uh, most of my presentation is about hard numbers. Uh, we tend to forget particularly dealing with, we economists tend to forget that healthcare is very important. It goes well beyond the issue of, of financing. So it is important there is always a very strong and good safety net for those who cannot afford paying for their health uh, services. Uh, supply constraint is the last point uh, that I want uh, to make, such as uh, a regulation of workforce and equipment and effective use of healthcare technology assessment, as in Canada, Hospital closure measures and reduction of, of number of beds are, were, are an example of what happened in, in Canada as part of health reforms there. And this is also associated with lower spending for uh, public sector health care. Uh, this, is, this is much uh, qualitative, but we also have some uh, attempt to quantify the impact of uh, savings through those uh, uh, tools. We have computed through some econometric analysis the impact of reforms. Uh, essentially, each uh, element, or each of the five previous elements, as well as other elements of the healthcare sectors, were quantified through indexes moving from zero to one. And then the issue, uh, we try to see how much could be saved if uh, countries move uh, not to the best performance, but to the average of the various countries, and, and this is the result uh, of the numbers uh, that you find in this uh, uh, table. Uh, again, this is in terms of the saving that could be achieved over the next uh, 20 years. Reform to improve, reform to improve uh, uh, competition and choice are quite powerful, they can yield almost half a percent of GDP. Uh, then impact of reforms that uh, relate to the group that I call contracting public management can save also almost 0.4 percent of GDP. Budget caps uh, is a bit lower but still a quarter of percent of GDP and then you have a lower for demand side reform and supply constraints but it's not, it's not uh, trivial. Uh, it should be noted as a caveat that uh, this cannot necessarily be added for all countries there are some constraints in, in the additivity of these uh, uh, measures uh, but that gives you a broad idea of what uh, could be saved through, through reforms. 
our analysis also indicates that things that do not really work uh, well, uh, price controls uh, is, uh, is one of them. These are often eroded by suppliers' responses, such as uh, directing patients to higher cost uh, uh, services. Uh, second, the regulation of insurance in the means increasing the extent to which key decisions are taken at the insurer level also doesn't seem to be very effective. Uh, third, and this is a bit counterintuitive, greater availability of information on the quality and price of healthcare services does not appear in our work to help reduce costs. In theory, more information helps. Uh, however, uh, our work and other people's work indicates the difficulty uh, that uh, healthcare consumers have in understanding uh, this uh, information. Uh, more important, this information may not uh, provide the incentive to reduce costs because patients could choose high quality, higher cost services over lower quality, high cost services, especially as we not bear the full cost uh, of the treatment. Uh, so this is a quite counterintuitive, but it's something that we find pretty, uh, pretty clearly. Uh, potential reforms uh, not included in our analysis. Uh, uh, some of them may be important. They have not been included primarily because of data limitation. They include uh, greater emphasis on preventing care and uh, improve health information uh, technology. So this has not been included because of lack of data limitation in our analysis. But let me say a couple of words of this. Uh, raising uh, the emphasis on preventing care can contribute quite a lot in our view to decreasing health uh, uh, spending. Governments can play in this respect a very important uh, uh, role in promoting good behavior and desire. For example, by promoting uh, less smoking, less alcohol use, and more exercise. They can also provide better incentive for uh, preventive uh, care, for example, linking cost sharing or insurance premiums uh, to having regular uh, checkups. Uh, the second point, sorry, here. Okay. Yeah. Okay, going back to this. Uh, health information uh, technology. Uh, improved use of uh, what we call the HIT, health information technology, can also improve efficiency. Uh, although its uh, benefits, I believe, needs to be yet uh, fully exploited. Uh, the use of HIT varies widely across advanced uh, uh, countries, and yet uh, uh, it could uh, increase uh, uh, adherence to clinical guidelines, enhance uh, disease uh, surveillance, decrease uh, medication errors, and reduce uh, service uh, duplications. Let me go to the last uh, slide of my... Uh, presentation. Uh, the saving generated by this simulation may not be, as I said, there is some margin of uncertainty, but in addition, they may not be large enough to, um, uh, to, to prevent an increase in the healthcare spending to GDP uh, ratio. In countries like uh, Austria, Portugal, <coughs> Switzerland, UK, and of course the US, where increases uh, on healthcare spending on current policies are very large. I mentioned the United States 5%, uh, uh, 5 percentage point of GDP increase over the next uh, 20 years. So deeper reforms than the ones that I mentioned earlier are necessary. In the United States, uh, for example, other options uh, to reduce spending uh, include uh, uh, the use of HIT, I mentioned it was not quantified uh, earlier for other countries, but uh, it may be significant for the, for the United States. And second uh, point for the United States that has been uh, often mentioned is uh, revising the favorable tax treatment of health uh, insurance uh, contributions, which could save uh, at least 0.5% uh, of, of GDP. So I should have... Uh, List this uh, here. Uh, okay, this is uh, this brings me to the end uh, of my presentation. Uh, clearly, the task uh, is huge for advanced countries, and this brings me back to my initial point. I believe that the healthcare reform is the key reform, the key challenge for uh, the public finances in advanced countries over the next uh, 20 years. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Uh, Dr. Quinn. What's the right button? Yeah. Yep. Okay. When it comes up. Yeah. When it comes up, yes. Well, I will tell you something about the healthcare reform we made in Holland in the last decade and the implications that we see and what has to be done for the future in order to get our healthcare system sustainable. And uh, I want especially to focus on, on uh, also on the labour market which has been mentioned because this is one of the big problems that Europe is facing. Um, some of the figures were showed about um, Germany and the German labor force will uh, decrease in the coming decades from 50 million to about 20 million people. So this is a major challenge for Europe and also for the Netherlands. Uh, let me see if it works. First of all, I want to tell you something about the reform we made, uh, the lesson, and then uh, about the implications and um, the reforms that have to be made. In addition to what we did, uh, I will show you something about that. Uh, as the last part of my speech. So the 2006 reform, which was initiated around 2000-2001, the impact and what's the way forward. First an impression of Holland, it's a small country. Uh, we have 70 million, 60, 70 million inhabitants. There are about 100 hospitals, well, medical specialists, child practitioners, and insurers, but they have decreased um, till now 11 companies, but actually they are about five or six uh, companies at the moment which dominate this market. We spend about 60, 70 million uh, billion on healthcare and it's about 10, 11 percent of our uh, GDP. Well, something about uh, the characteristics of our healthcare system, um, tradition of private initiative, hospitals, medical specialists, but also the private insurances. Uh, we had, before the reform, we had 60 percent of social insurance Yes, it's difficult to hear me. Okay. Um, before the reform, we had 60% of social insurance there, um, and 30% private insurance companies. But the 60% social insurance companies, actually, they were so, uh, sickness funds and they had a private character, although they were heavily regulated. And I will tell you something about this later. Well, the growing government interference came from the 1980s and the main objective was, and it was actually a kind of budget cutting, uh, cost containment, uh, detailed price regulations. Uh, for example, we introduced DGRs in uh, about 10, 12 years ago and we uh, have a special governmental body which, uh, which actually says what the price of each DGR is. What's a DGR? Um, well, what's a DGR? So, uh, it's a package between diagnosis and treatment, and uh, this package is being um, uh, it has been introduced in, in, in the USA and went to the uh, European continent. And so, diagnosis and treatment are a, a bundled package, and there you have a price setting by a government body. For example, a hip fracture. Then you have the diagnosis and the treatment, and that's a package which has to be uh, paid for by the insurance companies. And we had a national and regional planning. So the government was heavily involved in healthcare uh, policies. Well, we had some advantage because the cost didn't grow too strong. Uh, but in uh, at about 1999, 2000, there were many pressures on this system. And it had to do, if you look uh, at the uh, left side of the slide, uh, with uh, micro inefficiency. Because what we saw was a lack of spirit enterprise and no innovative climate, and there was rationing. And because of this lack of uh, enterprise, we saw enormous waiting lists coming up. And it had, this had to do with the budgeting, but also because we were running out of labor in those days because we had an enormous economic growth and a diminishing labor market. And what you saw in those days, and it's quite important because this is going to be the future of Europe. You saw because of this shortage of labor, you saw wage inflation. The wages went from 2% uh, um, annually to about 4 or 5 or 6%. Um, and this will have a major impact on the cost containment of the healthcare system if we don't want to solve, if we are not going to solve this problem. So we saw wage inflation on the one hand, and on the other hand, we saw uh, the waiting list going up. And then there the came kind of a public reaction 
and politics was heavily required to reform the system. <coughs> so what was our, our analysis? Uh, lack of cost consciousness on the consumer side. Um, we had, because we had a, a social, as I uh, mentioned, on the one hand we had a social insurance and on the other hand a private insurance, but um, if you were below a certain income level you were socially insured and heavily regulated by government and the people who uh, were above the income threshold, they were privately insured. And then what you saw, and you see it on the left hand side, unexpected financial effects if, uh, for example, you uh, were around the threshold, uh, up or above or, or beneath the threshold, and then uh, the income effects were quite large. The providers, and that's quite important, they had a lack of efficiency incentives, a lack of innovation, and that's why we had the waiting list problem. Well, then we started the reform in order to reduce the waiting list problem and to lower the cost in um, in our healthcare system by introducing competition. It's quite important because it has been mentioned uh, earlier that competition is quite um, uh, promising. But we wanted to reduce the waiting list, we wanted more freedom of choice for the consumer and the insured, and we want sustainable solidarity. So these were the, the questions. Shall we introduce competition or not? What will be the benefit package, uh, the premium structure, and how to build a sustainable healthcare system with a fair share of solidarity and by looking for efficiency because this was important. If we introduce more competition, then we will have more innovation and it will drive the costs down. And we need the prices going down in order to uh, keep, um, to, to be able to help all those uh, who are part of the aging of society. I take some water. Thank you. Well, um, as I said, we chose a model of competing purchases um, as seen elsewhere, for, but we have a more sophisticated system of competition, I think, than Germany. Uh, but I'll tell you more about that. But this was essentially what we are, were trying to achieve competing purchases and competing uh, insurance companies. So, on the consumer side, people could choose their own insurance company. Uh, the providers had to compete with another in order to be um, contracted by the insurance companies. And the insurance companies, they had the incentive to lower their premiums uh, in order to be attractive for the consumers and for those who, who uh, have to insure themselves. So, this is the essence of the reform, um, freedom of contracting uh, for the insurer. If he doesn't want a provider to be contracted, uh, he can um, deny them a contract. Uh, freedom of price negotiations. When we started the uh, reforms, we said, well, those DRGs that are mentioned, uh, the prices have been, are being fixed now by government body, and we said we have to liberate it so that insurance companies can contract uh, the um, healthcare providers and set their own prices. This was a heavily debated in Holland because the Social Democrats, they didn't want to have this liberation of prices and the Christian Democrats and the Liberals, they did want to. And when I was part of government uh, the last uh, period, um, my colleague of the Minister of Finance, he was a Social Democrat and we had huge political fights, uh, although they didn't reach the papers. Um, we changed the, 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 uh, the incentive from budgeting to output pricing um, insurers and providers they had to compete, as I mentioned. We introduced quality indicators in order uh, to um, create a situation in which insurance companies can make a difference. Because if prices are set and if quality is not transparent, you can't make a difference at all as insurance company. And so there won't be any competition. Uh, but the last part of the sheet is also quite important because we have many social safeguards, accessibility, <coughs> Uh, everyone has to insure themselves, but an insurance company cannot say, well, because you've passed or because you are ill or sick, we don't uh, give you an insurance. Uh, so affordability is, has been achieved by giving those people who can't afford uh, the benefit package, um, they get a subsidy and, well, the other things are less important. So we have compulsory insurance for the consumers. We have an open enrollment, a legally defined coverage, 
premium differentiation is not between those who are insured by certain insurance companies, although they can differ, of course, their premiums between the insurance companies themselves, otherwise competition would not be uh, possible. Uh, there is a risk adjustment and uh, we have income-related subsidies or contributions in order to um, make it possible financially to insure uh, yourself. Well, then we got the Healthcare Insurance Act, but I see I've got only 10 minutes left, so I leave this. <laughs> this is how the risk equalization works. People who are very expensive, then uh, the insurance company gets more money from the fund. For example, those who are older or uh, have diabetes. Um, and so, for example, person A, he is very expensive, person B is not expensive, and then you get less from the insurance from the equalization fund. This is done to be able to, to, um, to create uh, um, a situation in which uh, insurance companies compete with one another uh, on the prices and not, and, and not on the exclusion or inclusion of those who are ill or less, um, less healthy. Well, this I skip. Maybe uh, uh, if you look at the consumer, he is paying um, his uh, premiums on the right hand side, you see the, the, the premiums to the health insurer. The employer is um, uh, paying uh, half of the price to the uh, consumer and he has an income related contribution to the risk adjustment fund and both financial um, uh, means go to the health insurers and they are going to um, contract the care providers in order to get competition. Well, now, uh, nowadays we have this competition between the insurers on a price level. Uh, the effect, the, the impact was that in 2006, 20% of those who uh, insured themselves switched from insurance companies. So you could say that uh, the competi competition is working. Uh, why do we switch? Because there are um, quite, well, uh, uh, the difference in uh, the payments you have to make of the premiums are quite uh, great. So there's a fierce competition particularly the premium, um, people are quite satisfied with their insurer and product differentiation uh, is at this moment below a desired level. But we started this competition uh, in 2006 and as you see, uh, people who insure themselves, they, um, well, they look at the premium level and they um, act according to the uh, competition that we wanted. Well, as I told, the insurers of sickness funds have been consol consolidating. We don't nowadays have any sickness funds anymore. We all have private insurance companies. They compete with one another. And we don't have the income threshold, of course. Uh, we don't have it anymore. Well, um, if you look at the bandwidth, the last uh, um, part of the sheet, you can see that um, the difference um, between the premiums is um, let me see. There is the highest was twelve hundred and eleven euro a year. The lowest was nine nine six, as far as I can see. So there's a difference of about two hundred euro a year. Where are we now? Um, we had to take off this caution. Um, many of the DRGs were liberated, and so uh, insurance companies uh, can contract nowadays about 50, 70 percent of the DRGs. Uh, the prices are free, uh, but I want to tell you something about the impact the reform had as far as we can see now, and it gives you some uh, it gives some clue of what has to be done in the future. Well, we saw an enormous reduction in waiting lists. That was one of the goals of the reform that we made because of the competition and because of the innovation. We've also seen that prices went down. We've seen an improvement of labor productivity. Uh, strongly increased focus on uh, efficiency in the hospitals and we saw an improved consumer uh, experience. But then, this is quite instructive I think, if you look at the price increases then you see that while we, uh, um, we realized the liberalization that the prices went down, um, they also went down in 2010 and 2011, uh, even further than on this uh, scheme. But on the other hand, you see at the lower part that the volume growth was enormous. And so the total growth of hospital expenditure, prices and volume, well, it grew enormously in the last years. So 
you might say that on the efficiency level we were quite successful, but on the volume level we were not successful, and this will have a major impact on the labor market and scarcity that I mentioned. Because if we continue like this, then we will have an enormous problem uh, because of the scarcity of labor which is connected with the aging of society. Here you see the price developments once again for those parts which were liberated. Uh, the most blue, the dark blue, is the regulated part of the hospital care and the other ones are the deregulated uh, parts. So you see that by and by <coughs> prices went down and we became more efficient and innovative. But if you look once again at the volume growth, um, it's about 6% in 2004 and once again 6% in 2009. Uh, that's quite a far, uh, will give us big problems. And if you look at the impact of aging, we must conclude that this volume expansion uh, can only be explained by uh, it cannot be explained by aging because this contributes only one percent, uh, as has been mentioned, uh, of the total volume growth. You mean one percentage point or one percent? One per one probably one percent. Yeah, one percent. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And the impact of aging in the next uh, decades won't be uh, that big as many think because it will not go beyond the 1%, uh, it will even be lower than 1% point in the next uh, years and decades. So what is the explanation of the fact that we have such uh, volume growth in the center which is uh, a big problem? Well, if you look at our system, there are two big problems that we have. On the one hand, the incentives of our a reimbursement system, they are focused on volume. You get paid when you treat more. You get paid when you diagnose more. And on the other hand, we get a lot of fragmentation. And this slide is, give you, does give you some impression how the incentives work in our system. <coughs> on the one hand, you see the patient, and he wants to get cured. He has little medical knowledge, and he has an, uh, enormous access to care. So he pushes for something uh, to get done. Then you, you see the GP. He wants to secure the patients, he wants to get the workload done, he wants to have his income uh, uh, maximized. Um, he can refer patients to the, the, the hospital when, when it becomes too complex uh, and he is quick to refer the cases to uh, in, 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 when there is uncertainty. <coughs> the specialist level you see the same, he wants to, they want to maximize an income, they want to meet hospital expectations, uh, they want inflow of referrals and he is quick to recommend treatment in case of uncertainty. The hospitals, they also want to have more market share uh, and they all are also have many incentives to grow. Um, so they are pushing actually the specialists to, uh, to offer more treatments in order to get more income. And then you got the insurer, he has a price of volume control, but he only, he, he focuses usually on the price uh, and not on the volume, because if he is focusing on volume, then medical specialists and general practitioners usually say, uh, "Don't meddle with my affairs. You are not. You are not. Uh, you don't have a medical background." So, if you look at these incentives, it's quite obvious <coughs> that this is a system which is actually uh, supporting volume and volume growth. When I visited the United States two years ago, Mrs. Sibelius, with whom I talked about the healthcare system, she said one of our problems is that we are only paying contacts and only paying volume. And she is definitely right. So we should change that. And then the fragmentation. If, for example, in our system you see that the general practitioner is working hard on diabetes or heart failure or whatever, and you see that there are less referrals to the hospitals, then the costs per person are going down. But on the whole, on a macro level, we don't see these, these cost reductions because the, uh, the hospitals and specialists are filling it up. And if we have innovation, then actually what we are creating is new capacity in order to offer more healthcare. And that's why we have this enormous volume growth. And this has to do with the fact that there is an enormous um, large gray area that defines acceptable medical practice. And underuse and overuse, uh, because of this gray area, um, it is quite difficult to say what is overuse, what is underuse, and what's the correct um, uh, healthcare uh, provision. Well, what we saw in my country, for example, is the prices went down, quality went up, but more efficiency means more effective uh, capacity. 
and the capacity tends to fill up. And this is enormous frustrating because many, many people call to the, the insurance companies and say, why is this innovative ID or uh, I, I uh, have new technological innovations which might lower the costs. But if uh, that uh, means that uh, more efficiency uh, creates more capacity and it is being filled up, in the end, the costs are not going down, but actually you pay twice for the innovation and for the fact that the volumes are growing. So over-treatment is present in our healthcare system. Uh, there are many examples of this, for example, prostate cancer, tonsillectomy, um, and we see a lot of practice variation even in our small country, and there are lots of anecdotal evidence on over-treatment in uh, the Dutch healthcare system. I asked a couple of years ago one of our governmental bodies to make a study of PCTA, that's placing stents, for example, and 40% of those stents were unnecessary. And the cardiologists, they were quite angry and said it's uh, probably 20%. <laughs> and we see it on many, many issues. Well, that's, um, as I told you, labor, if we continue by this uh, uh, enormous supply, combined with the labor scarcity, that will lead to enormous price increases, wage increases, wage inflation, and to wait on this once again. So what we need to do, and that's I'm going to finish because the hour is already a minute over there. Um, we need to create business cases over the full cycle of care. Uh, we uh, we uh, need um, actually we need insurance companies which um, work in a network in, or in order to scale uh, the initiatives up. Well, maybe the next slide. No, it doesn't. Maybe. Yes, this one. Maybe this is the best explanation. What we intended to do when we uh, began with the reform was to lower the prices, uh, to, to lower the prices in order um, to accommodate the aging of society and because people we, 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 we thought would need more of healthcare. What, in my opinion, we should do now is to lower the volume and to give higher prices to those who, with quality initiatives, are actually lowering the volume uh, of our, in, in our healthcare system. Let me explain. If a pharmacist, for example, heavily invests in therapy adherence and people have less complications and will be not be referred to the hospital, nowadays he doesn't get paid for it. But th this is a quality initiative which in the end will, lower the vo will, will lead to lower volumes because there will be less referrals. So what we should do is to uh, price and to, um, um, to, to give those people a benefit which by uh, quality initiatives are reducing the volume. And that's why we, want, we have to change, on the one hand, our reimbursement system so that we actually are paying those people who initiate those quality uh, initiatives. Um, and on the other hand, we have to pay for the full cycle of care in order to uh, to get away from the fragmentation of our system. And that's why we need a network. And in this network, we need to uh, pay for the quality initiatives that the medical specialists and the pharmacists and the general practitioners in my country actually do want to uh, implement. But because of our system and because of our reimbursement system, because of fragmentation and our reimbursement system, uh, the incentives are wrong. Well, I leave this. Uh, I leave it over there. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, that's a great segue, uh, Mike, into what I think you're going to talk about. Sure. Are your slides loaded up? I hope so. All right. Thank you. Oh, that's great. So, I was a late addition to this conference. Uh, I was at a, a meeting that Rob held earlier uh, last week. And I was so loudmouthed and obnoxious that he decided to invite me to this one. <laughs> okay, so uh, my, I'm going to talk about uh, very quickly uh, what kind of innovation do we need to address fiscal problems, uh, and in particular, I'm going to make a distinction between fiscal constraints and long-term real resource constraints. Healthcare suffers from money illusion. Okay. We talk all the time about. Measuring healthcare spending as a share of GDP, measuring healthcare spending as a share of budgets, measuring it in dollars, measuring it in euros. Okay, but that's really not what we care about. What we really care about is what share of real resources 
does healthcare absorb in the economy? Because the bigger the share of real resources that the healthcare absorbs, the less is rest, the, the less is available for the rest of the economy. And so you can sort of imagine. And the worst case is that healthcare would absorb all of the real resources, in particular labor, and there's no one left to sort of do anything else in the economy. Nobody left to tax. Nobody left to, to produce goods for exports, and so forth. And basically, what happens is is that uh, is that what we're really talking about when we talk about the, the long-term health care crisis, it's not so much about the dollar amount or the euro amount. It's about the fact that we're worried that, that, that as our population ages, as new technologies are introduced, as the system seems to malfunction, that we keep absorbing more and more of the real resources in particular labor. So let me show you a, a, a chart. I only have two charts here because I was a late starter. <laughs> Okay, is this going to work? No, probably not. The other one. Not going to try the other one. Let's try one. I don't know if this is on. It's not glowing. Okay, let's try one more time. Okay, good. All right. So this is uh, what this chart measures is U.S. healthcare and social assistant workers per thousand population, and. Uh, and it shows that there has been an increase in the number of healthcare workers per per person per patient. Okay, over the last twenty years, it's been fairly consistent. Um, this is what is unsustainable about the U.S. current situation. That is to say, if you plot this out, if you plot this out over time. What happens is is that the healthcare system absorbs more and more of the workforce. Now, I want to say at this point is that this chart is drawn out of work that uh, that we at PPI are doing on 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 medical innovation as a way of attacking long-term healthcare financing problems. Uh, I'm working with our economist Diana Carew. Raise your hand, Diana, please. Okay. And so uh, we've got a paper coming out in about a, in about a month on this. And uh, if you're interested in getting a copy of the paper, please give your card to either myself or Diana. Um, so you know the definition for me of long-term sustainability or long-term unsustainability is that this trend continues up to the point where healthcare is simply absorbing so much of the labor force, which it does, if you project this out. 20 or 30 years, it doesn't take that long, that it basically gives you an unfunctioning economy. Now this is the US. Here's what's absolutely fascinating. <coughs> what I've got on this chart is I've got uh, the Netherlands up there on the top, then I've got the United Kingdom, then I've got Germany, then I've got uh, the United States, and I've got Italy. If I had Canada up there, which I took off this morning because it was just too complicated, Canada sort of is along the same lines as Germany and the United States. Don't worry so much about levels here because levels is a, you know, it's a social thing basically. Look at rates of change, and basically everybody's rates of change is about the same. So you have a situation here where every one of the countries is on an unsustainable path on real resources. What bending the curve means, in a real sense, is that is that we start we stop using more healthcare workers per patient. Now I did this per capita. I could do this per senior citizen, and it looks the same, slightly less. This is the, and this is the definition. Basically, this corresponds to what was said on the panel that demographics is not the major driving force, that we are using more healthcare workers per senior citizen as well. And another way of thinking about this is that in some sense the productivity of the healthcare sector is either weak or negative. So the real question here, the real question that I want to ask is how do you, what kind of technological innovation do you need to increase the productivity of the healthcare sector, to get us on a different track, to get us on a track where you're not forever increasing the number of workers per patient. Now, we heard said earlier what everybody believes, which is technological innovation is always increasing costs. This is a uh, this is a basic assumption of the U.S. government. 
Uh, the CBO has written about this. The Obama administration believes this. Basically, uh, it, under this uh, under this definition, technological this is this is a, it's a syllogism almost. Technological innovation increases costs. Rising health care costs is the biggest economic problem we have. Anybody who proposes new innovation is an enemy of the people. <laughs> this is a central problem right now that we face. Okay, because historically, in every part of the economy, technological innovation was viewed as the solution. Investment in technology was viewed as a solution to weak productivity, not the enemy. So this is what I propose. The first thing I propose is that we need to, we need to actually evaluate technologies by whether or not they're labor saving. Key point. Not cost reducing, but labor saving. There's conditions under which the two of these are equivalent. We, these conditions do not exist in any country right now. They're different. Okay, we, and okay, this is really important because our current in the U.S. our current FDA does not evaluate te evaluate technologies by by whether they're labor savings or not. In fact, they cannot. They do not have an intellectual framework which allows them to deal with technologies and decide whether they're, they're labor saving. So when the FDA is presented with a technology which is potentially efficiency increasing and labor saving, they don't know what to do with it. Uh, what I mentioned earlier was there, um, there was a, a, a product, a, a, a device called Melifine, which is a uh, non-invasive computer division of uh, vision device for assessing potential melanomas. Clearly, you could see how this could be used to supplement doctors and do this in a way that reduces costs and increases um, uh, uh, increases um, coverage simultaneously. What happened was the FDA originally gave this technology a non-approvable letter. This was back in March of 2010. The uh, company four and four and four got a panel. The FDA to convene a panel. The panel voted positively. The FDA was still sitting on it. I wrote a piece that basically said that if the same standards had been applied to the cell phone, that the, self, the original cell phone would have been banned because it garbled messages. <laughs> um, and so the, the place that we have at this point is that it may be that technology is increasing cost. We don't know which technologies are in fact labor saving and, and our system is not capable of giving us the technologies that we need. So what I would like to say kind of to address the fiscal problems, which are very real. I'm not saying the fiscal problems are not real. I'm not saying that we're not on a sustainable track. None of those tracks are sustainable. I don't know about Italy. Okay, I mean, this kind of, if the growth rate is the same, even though it looks lower on this chart, it's the growth rate that matters. None of the tracks that we're on right now is sustainable. The only way out is increased productivity and increased, um, uh, uh, bending the curve by less use of real resources. Now I completely acknowledge everything that the people on the panel said already. We have institutional flaws which allow, which you know could very well be that if you and if you had higher productivity technologies that people would overuse them. But I'm not sure we, I'm not sure we've even <coughs> tested that at this point. So I've just come to zero. I'm not going to run over. You already have. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right, thanks, Mike. Um, so I just want to build on that last point, and then, and then I want to let Carlo ask the panel question. But I think when we think about productivity, we think about it uh, in the wrong way because we tend to think about it in terms of the actual industry. So think about the haircut industry for a minute. You can envision really low productivity industry. It takes, you know, it takes your stylist an hour to cut your hair or whatever. So you can imagine sort of, you know, faster clippers or something like that. Uh, that would raise productivity in the hair community. Or you could imagine a pharmaceutical industry uh, company coming up with a drug that slows your hair growth by half. 
to have a double haircut productivity. <laughs> Seriously, that's a good one, Rob. I know. I really, really, I, I really want that because you would you would eliminate half the haircuts in the country. You wouldn't have to get. I mean, think about all. Seriously, I'm quite serious. Think about all the money people spend on haircuts that they could spend on because their hair grows. You, cut, you have your hair grow half as fast. You double haircut productivity. Same thing with what well, Mike's point is. If you could do a drug, if you can invent a drug that deals with diabetes, it's not like your diabetes doctor is becoming more productive. There's just a lot less demand for them. So I think that's the way we have to think about, and I think Mike, you would agree with that, that that's how we should be thinking about productivity. It's about how do we not just make existing processes more efficient, but reduce the demand for them. Uh, Alberto, did you have a comment or question you wanted to ask the I panel? I think we, given the time of speech, should be back here. In the All right. Front. Yeah, David. Hi. Can um, you identify yourself? Sure, I'm David Trinkard. I work for the Department of State. There's a lot of topics. My name is David Trinkard. I work for the Department of State. There's a lot of talk about uh, green health care, you know, about uh, improving efficiency of hospitals by you know, doing all sorts of things to make the hospitals and the places where you're actually doing this more efficient and, and use clean energy and things of that nature. Um, has that factored into any of the discussions that you're talking about in terms of reducing costs? My second question, though, is something I was hoping to hear about today is, um, I used to work in the IT industry. Ten years ago, we talked about mapping the genome. It happened apparently ten years before it was supposed to happen. That's what analysts said around 2000, 2001. And so from police shows, I know that I can be convicted or exonerated based on DNA evidence. Um, and from the Internet, I can find out or confirm my Anglo-Saxon heritage you know, from using DNA. But I haven't had a health practitioner talk to me about it. And I wanted to know if, you know, where that factors into um, healthcare innovations. You know, I, I just haven't seen it. As a layman, I haven't seen it as much. I know what's going on. I just want to know if that's going to be a paradigm shift or it's going to be something bigger okay. that we're looking for. Anybody want to do the first one? I'm Hi. First one, I don't think anybody's looked at that. Uh, I, I guess I'm kind of skeptical. I think most clean energy ends up costing money rather than saving money. But uh, hmm. uh, that's my sense. But there's probably some low-hanging fruit that hospitals could do. But Probably not a big thing. So, Mike, you want yeah, to I, I did a study of, 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 of innovation. I went back and looked at what people expected in 1998, and there's an awful lot of sort of biotech and genomics that were expected to happen over the next 10 years. It didn't happen. What happened is that everything turned out to be more complicated than people thought. The way that I think about it is they thought they were building a bridge to sort of cross a small creek, and they, dis they discovered that it was really a big valley but they're still crossing it. So the real question is, is when are they going to get to the other side? I actually think it's going to be pretty soon, at which point, the, I mean, and people have different views on this, and so at, at which point we'll actually have an explosion of, of technological innovation. At, and then you sort of get the split that's on this panel between the people who think that technological innovation is invariably cost increasing in healthcare, and those people who think that it couldn't be labor saving. Because right at this point, there's an immense amount of skepticism in governmental agencies, including the FDA, including OMB, including CMS, because what they've seen is years of technology not decreasing costs, but increasing. And there's a real, and there's a, there's a split coming here between whether or not that view can be proved to be wrong or redefined. Uh, before we go here, I just want to say there, there's a lot of, I think you, you, there's a lot of genetically based personalized medicine that's going on now. We, there's a couple of events we did that are on our website that you can see. One is uh, uh, NIH Cancer Bioinformatics Grid, for example. There's a childhood cancer that is um, very, very uh, obviously problematic. Or, uh, the, the treatment, they would give every child with this particular type of cancer the same drug and the same dose. And through uh, being able to take their genome, they identified that certain kids, about half the kids, need a lot lower dose, some kids need a higher dose, and they were able to eliminate uh, deaths because of overdose or deaths from the cancer because of underdose. So there's a, there's a lot of that going on, and it's, it's going you know, to keep going. So right here. Hi, I'm Lori Eldridge from the Alta Harm Institute. I had a question about mobile health technologies, um, for example, being able to uh, do readings uh, for various types of chronic conditions 
or basic readings, uh, uh, blood pressure, weight, temperature, oximetry uh, readings, or various tests uh, related to, to diabetes or other chronic conditions. Um, whether this is uh, part of a bundling uh, reimbursement uh, payment system where uh, you would reduce uh, uh, costs and that was part of the bundle, or if it was part of the reimbursement system for a fee-for-service system where you actually reimbursed for a mobile health uh, visit, per se, or a mobile health uh, uh, interaction. Uh, I was wondering if this was happening already in the Netherlands and also if this was labor-saving, um, according to Mike's um, overview. Okay. Well, what we tried uh, the last uh, years is to um, to introduce bundled payments for the chronically ill in the, for primary care. And um, so in a way I can tell you, yes, it, it, it's being done at the moment. Um, and it's quite successful. Mm. But what's quite important is um, that on the other hand, you see the cost going up because the inclusion criteria for those uh, who are defined as chronically ill and are treated as uh, chronically ill is going up. So you have to be uh, quite uh, aware of the fact that uh, the, the, these criteria have to be um, well have to be uh, solid proven. If but this answers your question, I, yes, it yeah. did. I just to follow up: is that does it decrease the the escalation of costs? So maybe it doesn't bring costs down. Well, we, we, absolutely, we see, but that the referral to the second line, what we call the second line, is the hospitals are going down. But then you see, uh, and this is really uh, very frustrating, that on the hospital level we don't see that co any cost reduction. Oh. We just see that it, it's being filled up. And that's why we need networks, and that's why in these networks you have to, um, well, you, ha you have to um, be aware of the fact that volume has to go down because of the improvement of healthcare in, in, in primary care. And if it's not, then it, this is heavily frustrating. And then you get the situation that innovation is not, uh, um, um, for example, the, the insurance companies don't want any innovation because they have to pay for the innovation and the costs stay the same at the hospital level. And it really is quite frustrating. Where we go here? Yeah. yeah, my name is Peter Boetsma. I'm from the Netherlands MSC. Uh, actually, next week, Friday, we have a presentation on three years of experience with bundled payments in the Netherlands. So anybody who wants to be there, Give me a card and I'll send you some more information. Oh, excuse me, yeah. could you repeat that so we can hear it? Or is that just the invitation just for one person? I couldn't <laughs> hear what you said. Just for her, or you can't. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually for everybody except okay. you. Uh, it's an invitation for an event on what the Netherlands healthcare. So if you'd like to come, just, oh. yeah, just give me a card. Give her a card. And, uh, you know. Or if there's a URL you want to say, we can do uh, it. Your URL website. Or, Thank you. Is it on your embassy website? Um, we can put it on the issue. Okay, yeah. When we go here, we'll take a couple more, and then I want to give the uh, the panels a little time to wrap up. But, yeah. Yeah. Uh, can you identify yourself? Steve Weitzman, Data Farm Foundation. I think we're going to see the reduction in cost of genome testing go down remarkably in the next two years. Uh, they're developing chips to do various algorithms with samples, and it's incredible. The other thing is that the pharmaceutical industry is now creating drugs and pairing them with biomarker tests, Pfizer, Lilly, among the leaders in that field. So personalized medicine is on the way. Uh, and the dire uh, predictions on healthcare costs will go down. This is not going to be technology of new equipment, giant GE imaging machines that wind up costing multi-millions of dollars for hospitals and the changes aren't really incrementally cost saving to the hospitals. Also analytics is going to change a lot of things. If we do more and more healthcare analytics on legacy data, we're going to find better outcomes, we're going to find the equipment that does better things, we're going to do better comparative effectiveness research between treatments and drugs. and. This is going to create jobs like crazy if we're willing in this country to make the investment in analytics. And it's a shame that we're giving $19 billion to doctors to buy PCs and software and not investing in healthcare analytics. It's just incredibly wrong. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 
Thank Anybody you. Anybody want to comment on that? Uh, I agree. Well, you need to know the problem is is that, that the amount that that the health care system doesn't know right now about what works is enormous. Okay, and so that as we move up the learning curve, uh, what we'll discover is that there's things that we weren't doing before that we should be doing that'll look like a cost increase. And there's things that we were doing before that we shouldn't. So I want to give uh, folks a chance to respond to some of the other things that were said. Let me let me do this first because I want to make sure, Carla, you, you, I know you wanted to make a couple of comments. So if we have time, we'll come back to no, it's, uh, it's just wanted to. I just wanted to comment a bit on this issue of uh, this point, a very good point made by Mick about uh, the the real cost. Uh, it's definitely important and critical to look at the resources absorbed in terms of labor. I don't want, however, to end this as if it were just an issue of number of people working in the healthcare sector for two reasons. First of all, cost also depends by the amount of capital you have invested in a certain sector. You may have a machine that saves uh, uh, the work of one person in the health sector, but then the machine costs uh, 10 people to build it, then you need to take this into account, and that adds to the cost of, of healthcare. Uh, second, uh, the relative price of medical services are important, at least from one perspective, because if the government is asked to pay the bill for health care, then of course it's not only the number of people who work in a certain sector, but also the relative price of health care services. So we need to keep uh, this in mind, the number of people is important, but it's not the only, the only thing. Uh, on the issue of technology, it's obviously true that uh, there are possible technological changes that can reduce the cost. My point, the point I make earlier, is that we should not kid ourselves and believe that just because of technology we're going to solve uh, the healthcare problem if we don't change something else. The history of the last 40 years is teaching us that technology, given the current institutional setup of the health system, is leading, yes, to better products, but also more expensive and, in the future, unaffordable products. So something needs to be changed to make sure that uh, the technology does not lead uh, just to better products, but also allows also to have cheaper uh, services. Otherwise, the current trends are not sustainable. Yeah. Um, let me... Uh, let me offer a similar, but some also somewhat different perspective on this uh, whole greater question. We've got more than half a century of research in economic history at this point, quantifying the what happened in current OECD countries over the course of their ascent to current levels of affluence. Right. So that in the United States, per capita incomes have increased by a factor of 10 over the post-Civil War uh, period, since, you know, since the antebellum era. Got documentation on Japan, on European countries, lots of other places too. Here's the funny part. Uh, increases in human beings at work and increases in measured capital stock can only account for a tiny fraction of this huge growth in per capita income. What's really made us rich has been improvements in total factor productivity. Okay. Uh, part of it's education, uh, knowledge base, but we're talking about innovation, technological breakthroughs, and better use of our existing resources. What's made the world, the Western world, rich over the last century and a half has been technological innovation and knowledge. So, why in the world would medical technology innovation be a contradiction to the rule which has made the West rich? If you believe this is the case, the burden of proof is on you. Point number two. 
Uh, if you look at this great transformation that has occurred over the last several centuries, you see enormous transformations in uh, labor force structure and enormous transformations in the budgetary patterns of households. Um, food has gone from being 60% of household budgets in the U.S. to 10% of household budgets. It's not because we're starving. <laughs> we're okay. Uh, maybe eating a little bit too much. Um, and over this same period of time that uh, the comparable fraction has been reallocated to other areas. Uh, we spend a whole lot more of our household budgets on leisure services and travel nowadays than we did 40 years ago. We don't talk about the unaffordability of leisure services and travel. We don't have a vacation crisis, right? But the government does not pay for the <laughs> This is the problem. Okay, this the is government a, doesn't pay for yeah, this, is, this is a public choice question <laughs> then. Right, okay. But that's all the beauty from That's it. It's a public, it's a public like choice it. question. It's not a fundamental question yeah. about resources. Uh, right. Thank you. No, it seems that's the key. That's the key point of the debate. I mean, you could envision a scenario where we double healthcare productivity, but we increase the rest of the economy's productivity by four times. And in that scenario, we're going to be consuming a lot more of our GDP will be in healthcare, by definition. So, so education is, becomes unsustainable. This is just, exactly. The, but the point is, these are bombal disease factors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, you are just simply, by definition, you are going to be consuming more low productivity things as a share of GDP. Inevitable. And it gets to willingness to pay. And this is right. where the consumer has to come into the equation. So let me ask a poll here before we close, because I, I want to ask each of the panelists, and I'll vote as well, if you think over the next 25 years there's a reasonable possibility that healthcare innovation with the points that Carlo is talking about of institutional reform, and the points uh, Dr. Klink is talking about institutional reform to make sure we're making the right decisions, we're not doing all the waste, uh, we're, we're getting doctors to have an incentive to put themselves out of business and productivity. If we assume all of that, how many people think that innovation can be a key driver of healthcare productivity and, and uh, cost reduction. <laughs> but it's a big if. You know, the problem is it's such a big if. If we can get incentives right, uh, which is something we're not doing so far. So I mean, if you look at pad dependency uh, in healthcare system in the last few years, I mean. We haven't been able to have very fundamental reforms, and any reform you're going to be pursuing is going to be very expensive politically speaking. Sure, but I think the point though that, that Mike makes is that, is, is that the the Washington consensus, I don't know about the European consensus, the Washington healthcare consensus is the way you reduce costs is you limit technology. But no, but and and I, what I heard everybody say was, no, that's not what, as long as you can get the right institutional reform. Uh, no, uh, no, uh, can I just add the and as long as you so, get the right technology, sure. okay? Because right now we, we do right. not vet technologies by whether or not they're labor saving. And the fact of the matter is that, you, that there's things that are out there that look, and, and I'm gonna I'm gonna even sort of talk about the, uh, who is sort of talking about the, uh, the being able to sort of identify which which kids need it. You, you were sort of saying, well, that could be very labor intensive to do that, what you were talking about doing all that counseling and so forth. The, the things, the, identifying which technologies are labor saving and which ones aren't may not be obvious at all. And uh, Carlo, if, if I would be very happy to sign on to the version of what you just said on the second go round. The second go round is technological innovation given the current structure. But I can tell you that in Washington, that's not the sentence. The sentence is techno technological innovation is the primary driving force behind rising costs. Okay, without the, without, I admit mean, it makes a big difference. It's, yeah, it's a matter, it's a matter of semantics. I think that we all know. We all know what the issue is. The issue is that what we call technological uh, process is the availability of better medical products. No. But to some extent, yeah, no, because that's, no, it's not. But well, that's what we have seen in the last 40 years. It has been a lot of this has been this. That's what it's. No, it, it's it's the availability of the of, of technology that can give you what you had before, 
Massachusetts with a lo with with less no, no, with less uh, with, with 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 less people. I understand. With that definition of technology, then it's tautological. The technology should reduce cost. The problem that we are talking about here is that we are talking about an improvement in the quality of the services that are provided. If there were a medical cure to cure cancer, but that cure were very expensive. The real issue is uh, what are the institutions that would allow to contain the cost and in a way rational, what is the rationing process of this miracle cure? That's the difficulty of the healthcare process. If you define technology by sa as something that reduces simply this, the cost of producing the same products, it I'll, would be I'll fine. Give, I'll, give you, I'll give you an example. Suppose that you consider, suppose that you consider sure, take a pill to cure, Mike, Mike, oh, sorry, to, 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 to cure lung cancer, just a pill. And it was a very expensive pill, yes. very expensive, but it required no other real resources. But what do you mean by no other resources if it is expensive? No, expensive <laughs> means that they require no, no other ones. No, no other ones. Real Basically, so, so, okay. I'm going to give you an example. Okay, okay. but just, you take, I'll, I'll explain to you what. You pay that $100,000 to the drug company. The drug company pays that to to the to to its workers. At every point along the way it gets taxed. From the point of view of the economy, and I'm leaving aside globalization at this point, which is extremely important. Okay, but assuming a closed economy, at every point along the way, you're extracting the taxes and that turns those people who were formerly doing cancer care are now doing something else in the economy producing something else and getting taxed, okay? And you know as well as I do, under that scenario, that fiscally we're gonna be just fine, okay? And economically we're gonna be just fine, okay? And I think that, I think that, that historically we've been on the wrong track technologically, and that's kind of, and the interaction between the technology and the, and the, and the institutions, okay? But I think, we can imagine other types of technologies that actually give us much better outcomes. No, that, that they agree. That is so I, I, mean, Mike, I thought you were going to say something else. The, the solution. I, I, I need let's to just say hypothetically, a second. I'm not running away. Getting lung cancer <laughs> and going through treatments uh, costs two hundred thousand dollars. So you have to go to your doctor. You have you got to go and you got to get radiation. Wait, let me finish. I know that. Let's just say it costs two hundred thousand dollars. I now have a pill that costs a hundred thousand dollars. That's not quality improvement. Let's just say you have the same rate of remission, the same rate of death. It's productivity improving. So I think I think you can have two types of innovation. Absolutely, you can have as many examples of this kind. The problem is that in the last forty years, this is not what has happened. So That's something right. must change sure. to have this kind of example Absolutely. to become reality. Exactly, and that to me is sort of the key. I guess if I have to summarize it, we should probably stop. I'll let Alberto have the very last word. But to me, the key. Part of what I think we were trying to do today was say, how do we begin to change the conversation so that we think about the institutional changes and the innovation changes that get us to that kind of cost-reducing innovation that's going to be so critical to going forward? Because if we just ration, if we just press down prices on doctors or whatever, you can't get there. You go to that, you can still have the same number of people in, in Mike's point. Alberto, do you want to? Uh, I will just like to add that, you know, point we are making now, um, bringing together, I mean, not seeing this as a fight in between people that oppose innovation as a, basically a cost driver and people that promote innovation as cost saving, is that really let's think of what is happening nowadays in European states that are on the edge. When you get in very dramatic situation, clearly, you get rationing of the worst possible kind. Why? Because the political economy of rationing over there, it goes exactly in the opposite direction of what you painted. Uh, you need to save as much as possible jobs, that is, at the end of the day, voters, or people influencing voters, traditionally big time, like medical doctors in the eye of the standard European politician, and therefore you cut anything which is around without having the luxury of thinking about, you know, what innovation is good and what innovation is bad in the medium and longer time. So I think the, the beauty of our discussion today is that we come uh, always to the point we need to think about a better institutional structure for our healthcare system. I mean, to accommodate aging, may it be 
such a big or not such a big driver of cost increase, but also to accommodate this kind of conversation in a much better scenario than the one we are having currently. Because the problem we have with our healthcare system and the way in which they've been structured, I mean, at least in continental Europe for the last 40 years, is that, you know, when push comes to shows, you get really ration of the bad kind instead of having the opportunity of focusing on good cost saving innovation. And with this, I would like again to thank you all because I think it's been a very interesting and fruitful um, discussion, and we all learned a lot today. So, also, please join me in thanking a great panel.